for the nectar of my poetry. How are we no doing? sweet water fruits they are anymore. Only the sand they piled up. No sweet water flows they are anymore. All right, you can hear someone else's voice. This is the voice of uh, K.M. Mustafa Anwar. Of the soul. It is only traversing in path to ruin the soul. I did in Portuguese. Not nice to speak over him. He's a friend of ours and broadcasting right li live right now from Facebook Live. I'll pay post his feed somewhere. He sings in Portuguese and English and Bangla. Probably among many other languages, a scientist and a spreader of sunshine, especially at difficult times. Thank you, Mustafa. We love you. And before I start today's reading, from Fools and Jesters at the English Court by John Southworth. Have I got his name right? Yes. I just want to tell you a little story of something very beautiful today. Not only the goats that are roaming or running the council of Hamdidna at the moment in Wales, escaping and having all the space to run around to know something even more beautiful, more close to home for me. Uh, I went out to the, my steps of the courtyard to get a bit of sun and I heard the kids downstairs in the next flat playing in their courtyard. A boy of about five with his younger sister, maybe three. I think they're from maybe Colombia the kid was standing or the, 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 the daughter was standing with her father her father's wearing a luminous yellow jacket and the daughter was standing there with her father watching her her brother circle around the courtyard on his bike and eventually he was told to come to leave the bike in the little shed. So he raced to the shed and crashed the bike into the fence. The fence collapses slightly on top of her head. She, of course, emits a squeal. Her dad comes round the boy, and before he has time to arrive at her, by her, she stamps up and down her feet like this in pain. Up and down, trying to shake the pain away. Her dad cushions her against his chest. She seems a bit comforted then he squats down and gives her kisses on her forehead. It seems to take away some of the pain and the, the hardships at the moment. So I'm going to cut you off now Mustafa, thank you very much for your broadcasts. Let's get into it. We're going to be with chapter 6 of this book about fools and jesters in the English court. And this chapter is called The Innocence. The Innocence were either the hysterical, uh, um, positively pathological in within English courts, so those who were perceived to be, or they were supposed to be mentally retarded. Um, I'm not sure what the politically correct language is, but they were either slow, as it was perceived to be slow, retarded, or they were perceived to be psychotic, hysterical. They had a very different role in medieval society. <clears throat> so let's get straight to it. Though we have waited so long to meet with the natural fools, it should not be supposed that they were altogether absent from the courts of the Anglo-Saxon, Norman or early Plantagenet kings. Indeed, some of the individuals who have featured in earlier pages, such as Williams Gollet, the eavesdropper of the Bayeux Tapestry, and Henry III's Jacquemin, may themselves have belonged to this category, but we are not told enough about them to determine whether they did or did not. And there were doubtless many others, both natural and artificial, who failed to achieve notice at all. Just remembering that dichotomy of um, natural fools 
and professional artificial fools who knew what they were doing, who, who at least exhibited more consciousness of what they were doing or awareness. If the artificial or counterfeit fools are assumed to have been to have modelled their behaviour on genuine madmen or, in inverted commas, simpletons, the precedence of the latter may be taken for granted. <clears throat> From the earliest times, natural fools, of whom the madman represents an extreme in his near, near total loss or abandonment of reason, have provoked a strangely mixed set of responses comprising, in varying proportions, fear, pity, contempt, laughter and awe. In certain cultures, the madman is thought to be in communication with a world of spirits and is attributed with powers of clairvoyance and prophecy. And here we come to the world of Islam. Islam um, has a strong tradition uh, of jinn or, or ghosts. And on a related note, they have a place for mad, perceived people perceived to be mad. As a 14th century Muslim historian put it, the mad have cast upon their tongues words from the unseen and they tell them. In other words, the unseen, which is written with a capital U, tells the mad or the so-called simpletons some divine knowledge or gives them divine knowledge. In the Islamic tradition, a number of these jinn, so that's spelled with a d, d well, in this version, D-J-I-N-N, jinn, or it's a kind of ghost in this Islamic culture. A number of these, Isla uh, of these jinn inspired fools occupy a position close to, if not exactly that of, court buffoons. The way in which they combined the functions of saint and joker is nicely exemplified in an anecdote of Buhlul al-Majnun, or Buhlul the Madman, at the court of the powerful Harun al-Rashid, which is from around 763 sorry, to 809-809. When Harun went on pilgrimage to Kufa, he ordered that Buhlul should attend, dressed in black, to pray for him. Buhlul complied, but his prayer was so uncomplimentary as to be risible. His prayer was so insulting or so lacking in the pleasantries as to be harsh or insulting, implying that the caliph cared only for money. The governor of Kufa ordered that he be beaten, but Harun merely laughed and countermanded the order, countermanding to reject with another offer or another order. On another occasion, when rebuked by Harun's courtiers for his frankness, Buhlu replied, you and your people, you and people like you, have spoiled the caliph. Whether he was protected by his madness or his sanctity or a combination of both remains an open question. Uh, a psychological reading of many of the lives of saints could classify them as pure schizophrenics, people who couldn't filter voices properly. In the West, treatment of the insane and of the mentally ill was, for the most part, surprisingly down-to-earth and pragmatic throughout the medieval period. While frequent recourse was had to prayer and pilgrimage, medieval doctors such as the 13th century friar Bartholomeus Ang Anglicus or Bartholomeus Anglicus inclined to physical diagnoses along the lines of the ancient Hippocratic theory of the humours as prescribed and prescribed bleeding, dietary regi regimes and hermal re remedies. The old beggar's advice to the poet Hockleave in his Regiment of Princes of 1412 to talk about the causes, causes of his melancholia as a means of overcoming it anticipated Freud. In popular romances and plays ranging in dates from the 12th to the 14th centuries, love-crazed heroes are treated with a combination of magical potions and behavioural strategies in which common sense and kindness are shown to be, shown as being most effective. In the early 13th century romance of Amadus and Idoin, I don't know if I pronounced that right, Amadus or Amadas and Idoin, Idoin is with a Y, the mind of Amadas gives way when the father of the lady he loves forces her to marry someone else. 
His embarrassed servants conceal him from view and are obliged to bind him for his own and others' protection. Various medicines are tried without success, but Amadas or Amadas escapes and wanders off to Italy, where, years later, his former sweetheart finds him naked, dirty, and with shorn hair. She cures him over a period of time by talking to him and gently repeating his name and hers, which she declares, quote, is the best medicine, the most helpful and the finest. I'm going to read that last sentence again. The cure for this poor, heartbroken, potentially psychotic man, the cure for this man was as follows. His former sweetheart found him naked with his hair shaved. She cures him over a period of time by talking to him and gently repeating his name and hers, which she declares is the best medicine, the most helpful and the finest. All you can give to someone is your time in this situation. And she repeats his name and hers. It's, it's as if in a verbal sense, she's just touched his hand. The incurably insane were supported in and by the community to which they belonged, normally within their immediate family. Excuse me, where have I put it? Okay, excuse me one second, just looking for something. Well, it's thrown away. Never mind, put a bookmark here. The incurably insane were supported in and by the community to which they belonged, normally within their immediate family, but in the absence of alternative institutional arrangements for their long-term accommodation and care, those whose relatives were unable or unwilling to look after them and those like Amadas or Amadas, who had escaped the physical restraints imposed on them, joined the ranks of the vagrants, a constant but containable element in medieval society. Vagrants. Vagrants were the wandering people, usually young men, as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware. Monasteries provided a huge service to these people. So when the dissolution of the monasteries occurred during the time of Henry VIII, so this is the early I think, yeah, early 1500s or mid 1500s, no, it's early 1500s in England, when Henry VIII ordered the destruction and robbery of the monasteries, young men had nowhere to go. Um, in accordance with a Celtic tradition going back to the 7th century, some of these sought refuge in the extensive wilderness and forests of the time to survive as best they could on wild berries and occasional coney. Coney is a uh, thing of Coney Island. Coney is the, uh, it's like a rabbit guinea pig creature. So they would survive on wild berries and the occasional coney, providing some basis in fact for the persistent medieval myth of the wood woeses or wild men with which mothers would scare their recalcitrant children. But the majority of the dropouts and escapees took to the road, traveling from one religious house to another where their immediate needs would be met. In the larger monasteries, they were usually allowed to rest for two or three days before being sent on their way. There too, probably for hygienic reasons, their hair was cut short by the monastic barber, which accounts for their shorn heads and the occasional tonsure. We've seen this in the tarot, the whole, so the circle of shaved uh, or baldness uh, in the head, uh, and the occasional tonsure or tonsure with which these insane frantic, as it's known, fools appeared in the Psalters. The Psalters are the book, it's the book of Psalms. The, the element of holiness in many, uh, I can think of a couple uh, of monastic orders, is the loss of hair, the lack of hair. The, like the, the punk rock attitude, I am going to uglify myself and show you that I am somehow otherworldly or so different from your world that I'm practically an alien. I don't see much difference between putting a safety pin through your nose and having a medieval monastic tonsure <laughs> shaving the middle of your hair. But a lovely marker, I mean, we all know how it feels when you get your hair cut uh, and you um, feel regenerated somehow, especially when you shave it. It's a luxury of a man, I guess, but I can recommend it to anyone. Um, but also just changing your clothes. This is really why I'm wearing a stupid tie. It's just, it makes you feel different. It makes you feel like you're inhabiting 
something else. And that brings me to the word habit. Habit's fascinating. The word habit comes from to have uh, uh, historically. But it, it, I think the primary meaning of, of this was actually the clothing, the clothing of monks and nuns and priests and so on which we call today the habit. The habit of the priest is in fact what they wear, the vestments. Um, and we'll be talking about the habits of um, fools and priests and so on later on. But we literally inhabit a different person, in my opinion, very much in that Virginia Woolf idea that we constantly re recycle our personalities, like uh, the board of a trivial pursuit, the little segments of what makes up a person changes according to who we're with. And even potentially for me, what we uh, are wearing uh, another thing uh, would be changing the furniture in your room uh, and see how it makes how it breathes life into into your your living space. Why is spring cleaning such a common trait among many cultures? A common cultural practice: spring cleaning, bashing the walls, bashing the rugs, getting out the uh, potentially the dirty evil spirits of the winter. That's just a psychological thing of psychic uh, hygiene. The tonsure, so again, that's that bold patch, the deliberate artificial bold patch put in the, uh, the, the scalps. Uh, the tonsure may have been thought to have a therapeutic effect on their troubled minds. It would also have provided a degree, a degree of protection. It announced to the world at large, including less than sympathetic villagers they met on their way, that in contrast to the shaggy men of the woods, the church had put its mark on them and claimed them for their own. In members, however strange and repulsive in appearance or eccentric in behaviour of God's kingdom on earth. And remember, the early Christians perceived the church to be the people, the people. And certainly something you hear with these... Um, rather uh, f fanatical uh, Christian and particularly Baptist sects at the moment, they plant churches, right? They do it grassroots and organically to their uh, reluctant state, to their credit, but they are doing it from a gr grassroots or even like a r rhizomatic basis. Um, the point being that it's organic and they view themselves as God's hands, God's hands. They are the workings of God. Just like the cardinal who is understood to, by putting on the glove of being becoming a cardinal, very high up Catholic official, on putting, up, putting on this glove of this Catholic office, he loses his hand, he loses possession of his body, and the body belongs to the church, the cathedral, uh, so to speak, the column of the believers, the verticality uh, of com 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 <laughs> communal uh, worship. So the church claims these mad people for themselves. Mad, in inverted commas. In an English 14th century version of the, of the story of Robert of Sizil, again, I'm not sure about the pronunciation, I'm going to say Sizil, Sizil, a proud king who derides the scriptural teaching that God has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted the humble, is punished by being transformed into a fool in his own household. So the king is inverted, just like the carnival traditions all across the world. The low becomes high, the high becomes low. His place is, is, as king is taken by an angel in his identical likeness who calls for a barber and commands that Robert, I'm going to do my best with this next poem, should be sure all around like a frere, like a friar, and an handbreadth above either ear, and on his crown make him a cross or a cross. Difficult to read that because it was written, I think, in the in the yeah fourteenth century, and the spellings all different. So the the the, the, the uh, someone takes the place of the king, a symbolic like robot robot king, or someone who's like the the, the hyper real king, so to speak, the plastic king, the uncanny valley king, and their hair is to be shorn. To, to be shaved all around like a friar. Um, and then I, I, I don't really get a hand breadth above the ear. I can't really understand what that means. I think they keep remain. They allow the hair to remain just above the ear. because That looks really great, obviously. 
Um, and on his crown, make a cross. So make a cross of hair <laughs> on your head. I can't see this as anything else but deliberate ritual humiliation, not in the kind of hazing way, but a literal humiliation in terms of bringing someone down to the hummus from where we get the word humiliation. Hummus is earth. A tonsure of this kind is found on the head of a near-naked madman shown in plate 5b from a 14th century Bible. Um, the, 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 pictures, the pictures are so beautiful in this book um, and it's really quite tough to show you these but I'm going to do my best, just give it a go. Um, if not, I'll try to maybe put the link uh, of the image up somewhere in the description later on when this is uploaded to YouTube. So we're looking at um, the bottom image here. Uh, so I'm going to try and point to it there. I don't think the light's any good, so I might just give up on this. But uh, you've got a man in the center kind of uh, reluctantly biting into a wafer. Um, <laughs> um, so the description of this, this image is, a small dog looks up to his master in expectation of scraps while a worried Christ observes the scene from above. Note glum expression on the face of the marot. The marot is the stick belonging to the, um, to the fool. It's like a ceremonial um, attack weapon. And it itself has a, a face and it's looking miserable. Perhaps we can consider medieval Europeans as more, or people who inhabited Europe at that time, as, as more animist, as believing in spirits of objects. Um, another such fall from a Parisian Psalter of slightly earlier date has the tonsure without a cross. The use of a hood by fools of the innocent kind as depicted in the Psalters may also reflect a monastic influence and though the naked or semi-naked figure remains the commonest type of Psalter fall, the hooded fall, with sometimes the hood thrown back, is almost as frequent in its appearance. Now here's the juice, here's the meat, because we're going to get on to, the, predictably, Foucault who wrote Madness and Civilization and argued that it was all brilliant for mad people back in the medieval period. And now we've, we've uh, with uh, psychiatric institutions, we've now um, imprisoned them and uh, classified them. And we've, we've become fear, fearful of madness itself. We've uh, invented madness, so to speak. Before then, madness was much more incorporated in daily life. Uh, Foucault's point was not, I believe, to be scientifically or historically valid. Um, I don't think valid is the right word, but he really wasn't good with sources, as far as I'm aware. Uh, some historians think he's an absolute travesty um, in terms of, of being a kind of rigorous source-based uh, historian who actually uses proper sources. But I don't think that was Foucault's intention. I haven't read Madison Civilization. I've read a little bit around the subject. And as, well, as far as I'm aware, Foucault is not admired for being a, 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 an actual historian. He's admired for being a theorist, a philosopher, a provoker of ideas. And there's one thing I think people can agree on with Foucault is he provoked thinking. He, he uh, started discussions and his writing is, is really rather beautiful in many passages. Um, so if I've got some some quotes from Madison Civilization. Um, he, he's definitely worth your time. Uh, I suspect he uh, was really lacking a kind of moral backbone uh, in his life and in this, in this uh, very uh, limited view of, of, uh, of madness within several different cultures. He was only curious in how people talked about madness, how they discussed it. Uh, not necessarily on maybe empirical things like numbers and so on. Um, there's a really beautiful quote, I'll just re read it quickly, from Madness and Civilization. Uh, a history of insanity in the age of reason. It's a kind of predictable postmodern critique of the Enlightenment and, of Enlightenment and modernity. Here's a quote from Foucault. Death as a destruction of all things no longer had meaning when life was revealed to be a fatuous sequence of empty words. When... Uh, death, was, death was nothing to the people in the medieval period because uh, life itself was uh, revealed to be a foolish sequence of empty words, the hollow jingle of a jester's cap 
and bells. The hollow jingle of a jester's cap and bells. I think what he's implying is that the madman had such a significant role. Uh, again, I use that advisedly, madman, the simpleton or the, 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 the fool at the court. Um, and life was symbolised in the jingling of the baubles, the, the round, the spherical objects within the madman's uh, uh, cloak and the vestments, the habit, so to speak, that jingled and gave this kind of divine music uh, that, that spoke more than actual words. Um, the, 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 the problem was leprosy had been more or less cured, as I understand it, and all of the hospitals, the, the pr 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 how do you say, uh, primitive hospitals, which housed the lepers, we have them in Lisbon, like in Sao Lazaro, in, in the Intendente area of, of Lisbon, what happened to those hospitals? Well, they had to have some function, so uh, then the mad, the perceived mad, were brought there and given uh, psychiatric treatment. Uh, that's That, as I understand it, is the idea in Foucault. So here we go. Before what, before what Michel Foucault has termed the great confinement of the 17th century, when the insane were locked away in supposedly remedial institutions of one kind or another, the most striking feature of their situation was their visibility at every level of society, including the highest. Whether treated with kindness or cruelty, and then there are plentiful instances of both, they were accepted as a normal thread in the social fabric. I think it's important to realise that, that that can be true, as well as it can be true that the medieval church and lay people systematically persecuted the mad. Uh, the perceived mad. I think that that's really important to realise that both these things can be absolutely true at the same time. Uh, it may be more the case that the mad were incorporated in, in everyday social fabric, as both Foucault and John Southworth here, the author of this book, argue. It's just really important that we don't exaggerate that uh, so the perceived wisdom and openness and open-heartedness and generosity of the medieval Europeans compared to nowadays. Whether treated with kindness or cruelty, they were accepted as a normal thread in the social fabric. When in the 12th century, in, excuse me, when in the 12th century tale of Tristan's madness, the hero disguises himself as a frantic fool to gain access to his beloved Iswit, Iswit, <laughs> don't know how to pronounce that, Iswit, then wife to his rival King Mark, he changes his appearance by tearing his clothes, shearing his hair and scratching his face. He attacks everyone he meets on the road and is pursued by showers of stones, but is able to walk straight into the court and the presence of the king. For no door, we are told, was closed to the full. If you want to get into the court in medieval Europe, tear your clothes, sh um, shave your hair, break your iPad, and you, with a smashed screen glimmering in the frantic sun, you'll be allowed into the court. The, the door is always open. When, after some riddling exchanges between the two, the king expresses sympathy for him, Tristan tells him, what does it matter to me if you are sorry? I don't care a scrap. And the attendant knights comment to the king, no one heeds a fool or argues with him. Now, this is the, the strange dichotomy here. No one heeds or listens to a fool and no one argues with them either. So where are they? Are they kind of like nomadic, no, no people, aliens? Are they effectively these kind of lizard men who scale the earth and aren't accepted but aren't rejected as well? Or are they actually deeply listened to? The answer is they were listened to and they changed many, many dis, uh, minds of many, many kings and queens. To, uh, excuse me, but in the Psalters, and again the Psalters are the, is the book of Psalms, as we have already seen, no less a person than David the psalmist is shown in argument with a whole succession of fools, both clever and frantic. In illustration of Psalm 52, when fool, a fool is described as uh, not believing in God or denying the existence of God. And in some of them, the figure of David is replaced by that of Christ himself. Satan, too, is brought into play. Uh, the confrontation pictured, uh, or the co a confrontation uh, between an innocent fool and a demon remains in doubt. Is the demon repulsed, or is he about to carry his victim away in triumph? The fool, having said in his heart, "There is no God." Whether you can compare the fool uh, to to angels is potentially fruitful, and to saints as well. I think there's a great mush of definitions between saints, fools, and angels. Angels are technically. Uh, not humans. Uh, they're depicted without genitalia in the film Dogma, for example, and they are strictly called neither man nor women. 
in the sense of not having gender and not being human. Saints are said to be otherworldly, so containing something that is heavenly, and fools themselves possess an inspiration which wasn't normal, but was accepted as part of social life before the Enlightenment. To Saint Anselm of Canterbury, commenting on this first verse in the psalm in the 11th century, the denial of what was to him the self-evident truth that God exists was itself a symptom of folly that could be met and overcome by reasoned argument, his famous ontological proof. This is Saint Anselm. But for a long series of saints and mystics, beginning with Saint Paul and, and extending through Gregory the Great in the 6th century to Francis of Assisi in the 13th, the simplicity of the fool was seen and presented as the model for a spiritual ideal of detachment and humility. In opposition to the intellectual vanity and acquisitiveness of the worldly wise. Paul tells his Corinthian converts that if any of you thinks of himself as wise, then he must learn to be a fool. Why? Because the wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. The wisdom of this world is foolishness to God. This is in a letter from Paul to the Corinthians. Gregory praises the honest directness of the fool in contrast to the expediency of those who seek to conceal the truth. Think of those Bruegel or uh, Hieronymus Bosch uh, paintings of carnivals and the feast of the festival of the fools. Francis and his early followers were not afraid to assume the title and role of Mundi Moriones, fools to the world. And in Langland's dream, his famous poet uh, uh, poem, uh, the dream of uh, something 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 by a poem, poet called Langland. The dream of the field of folk and his Pierce. There we go. It's called Pierce Plowman. Pierce Plowman, circa 1378. It is left to the lean lunatic to instruct the king in his duty. The lunatic of being, of course, related to the moon, la lune. Quote from Pierce Plowman, may he grant you grace, may he grant you grace to be so just a ruler that you may win the love of your loyal subjects and the reward of heaven hereafter. A message that is seconded in the poet's vision by an angel. So there we go. Angels and fools, in my opinion, are the intermediaries of God. That's why we call it the, 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 the mad lunatics, because they have, of course, the relation with la lune, the moon, lunar visions. Uh, and they seem to be not quite human, but they are respected as being connectors to the divine for the leaders of worldly affairs, kings. Here then is the paradox that lies at the heart of the medieval attitude to the insane and to natural fools in general. Insofar as their mental incapacity was of such severity as to disable them from any true understanding of themselves or of the world around them, they are used as a figure of, as a figure or iconographic symbol for those who, in their folly, deny God. But in the world as perceived by Paul and later moralists, a world that has gone itself mad, that itself, a world that has itself gone mad in the pursuit of material values and personal profit, the fool is looked to as a source of wisdom. I'm thinking of all the, all the comedians that have entered power recently in politics and the difficulty of comedians to make satire or political satire right now. The world turns upside down. Who's the first to speak for us? The politician comedian, the comedian politician or the stand-up artist. The fool is looked to as a source of wisdom in a world that has, has itself gone mad. The world itself has gone mad. The world itself has turned upside down. Visions of Quakers, for example, in America, early America, when the world itself was perceived to be so inverted, the values shifted so wildly that Quakers were running around naked. Quakers were running around cross-dressing to, to demonstrate this, the, the, almost as an expression of the earth having become mad itself. The key to an understanding of the apparent contradiction here is theological, for not even those frantic fools, in, in adverted commas, whose insanity was congenital, were barred from baptism. So no one in this sense, uh, mad or sane, were, were barred from baptism. Everyone could receive uh, God's blessing. Or from the Eucharist, if they were able to receive it with due reverence. As St. Thomas Aquinas explained, stupidity, in other words, the, fo the folly of the kind that leads men to deny God, 
uh, to quote Thomas Aquinas, implies a dull heart and blunted senses. Stupidity is opposed to wisdom, madness, just its absence. Stupidity, according to St. Thomas Aquinas, is opposed to wisdom. Madness is just the absence of wisdom. Judgment can be blunted in two ways. By, a, by natural disposition, as in the mad, and that is no sin, or from so burying our senses in earthly things that we cannot see divine ones, and such stupidity is a sin. Sin, strictly speaking, is orientation away from God. It's not a stain. It's not a moral stain on you that never leaves. It's a lack of orientation to God. It's a very charitable way of misdemeanors, for example. But among the gifts of grace that the sacraments were believed to confer was wisdom, which the Spirit distributes as he wills. Excuse me. Though incapable of reason, and however recalcitrant and difficult their behaviour might be, the truly insane could not be held as most morally responsible for their actions, and were thus, like children under the age of reason, incapable of sin. They were, in the strict theological sense, innocents whose foolishness could act as a shield against the corruption of the world and the deceits of the devil. This belief in the essential goodness of the fall, along with a, con with a current concept of worldly, even churchly hierarchies, as belonging to the purely temporal order and the expectation of a divine apocalyptic reordering, in which the first shall be last and the last first, provided initial inspiration to the feast of Fools. The Feast of Fools is a big section today uh, in today's reading. Um, so first of all, uh, the first shall be last and the last shall be first is from Matthew 19.30. 19.30. Uh, so it's like chapter 19, verse 30, as I understand it. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. This is the, to me, strong reflection of what I perceive to be the core of Christianity, which is the uh, to put it glibly, the, the religion for the losers. Uh, Christianity is at the beginning and in, in my view and at heart, I shouldn't even say Christianity, the teachings of Jesus were for those who were seen to be the most rejected by society, the outcasts. Who does Jesus hang out with? Who is he with? He's not only with prostitutes, um, he's not only with criminals on the cross, He's with the tax collector, who is sort of a more high-class societal reject, slightly higher class or more of a bureaucratic class than, say, a prostitute. So Christianity is for those who are most potentially perceived to be most directed away from God, but in a, in a sense actually closer to, to God because they've kind of earned this access to God because of their sin. The sin almost is the first step to being absolved of sin. If Jesus didn't have anyone to sin, then he, th his place on earth would be completely unnecessary. The first shall be last and the last shall be, fir last shall be first. And then we have the feast or the festival of fools. This is an amazing uh, cultural phenomenon that we've well, lost. Um, beginning in the 11th century as part of the Christmas Tripudia or Tripudia, the days immediately following on the great feast of the nativity this extraordinary annual celebration of folly was to reach the height of its popularity throughout throughout europe in the later middle ages the feast of fools it's amazing what went on in the feast of fools it's it's well described here but there's a very good article on atlas obscura about this um which describes from the perspective of the the priests uh, what on earth went on in the Feast of Fools? It was a New Year's feast, so it happened after um, after Christmas, of course, and before the festival of circumcision, which I didn't realise was a thing uh, until today. Feast festivals of circumcision is where Catholics celebrated the dismemberment of their Christ figure. Uh, the Feast of the Circumcision is something like eight days after Christmas, after the birth of Christ. And it was a celebration of the bloodletting, the first drops of blood to leave Christ, and the celebration of Jesus, not just as some divine figure, but also as a human as well. Um, so before the Feast of the Circumcision, you had the Feast of Fools. And there are sort of conflicting accounts of what actually went on, and potentially some of the accounts that are mentioned here are wildly exaggerate, exaggerated by upset clergymen. 
Uh, but according to Atlas Obscura, um, sounds sounds like a lot of fun. I'm quoting here for Atlas Obscura. This New Year's Day celebration uh, caught up high-ranking church officials in a bacchanal unworthy of their exalted positions. And there's a quote from a priest from 1445 who is recorded as saying, priests or writing, priests and clerks may be seen wearing masks and monstrous visages at the hours of office. They dance in the choir. So the choir is the part of the church behind the nave, or behind the uh, altar, sorry, I believe. Or it could be behind the nave, who cares? It's where the choirs sing, okay? So they dance, the priests dance, dressed as women <laughs> in the choir. Uh, and minstrels are included. They sing wanton songs, so rude, rough, bawdy songs about worldly things, about sex and stuff. They eat black pudding. Good Lord. While the celebrant is saying mass, they play at dice. So they gamble <laughs> in church. Exactly what Jesus warned of. But maybe that was the point. You inhabit the sin. You inhabit the uh, the taboo. They run and leap through the church without a blush at their own shame. So end the quote from that priest. Officially banned in the 15th century, the Feast of Fools had its origins in 300, 300 years before in the 1100s and continued as a tradition well into the 16th century. It was memorialised in church documents condemning its successes and in paintings depicting streets full of merry chaos. It appears in Victor Hugo's famous 19th century novel, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, where Quasimodo is so swept up in the festivities and crowned, is swept up in the festivities and crowned himself the King of Fools. This, to continue with Atlas Obscura, this rowdy revelry may never have been quite as raucous as it was rumoured. It started out much as a much tamer liturgical celebration, which accrued an outside reputation, outsized reputation for its subversiveness. At its heart, though, the Feast of Fools always turned power on its head, a reversal that naturally made church leaders very uncomfortable. And if there's one burgeoning theme throughout this, continuing theme throughout this book, it's that the church didn't really like fools in many ways. The church leaders were suspicious of them because of the perceived inversion of, of power. Could talk all day about that. Um, continuing with uh, John Southworth's book. On the 6th of December, the feast day of St. Nicholas, in a parallel affirmation of the innocence and wisdom of the child, a boy bishop was chosen from among the choir and altar boys. And on the 28th of December, the feast of the holy innocents, he was permitted to preside over the liturgy and preach a sermon out of the mouth of babes and sucklings. On New Year's Eve in cathedrals and, and minsters, um, like think of York Minster, the huge, um, huge church, which is where young men would as uh, assemble before going on crusade. In cathedrals and minsters, wherever a, su a sufficient number of clergy was present, the office out of Vespers began as normally, but on reaching the words of the Magnificat, he has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted the humble, to lift the humble, the verse that Robble Robert of Sizil had been so unwise as to mock. The subdeacons and the other junior clergy rose in a body from their usual lowly seats and chanting Deposui, put down, put down, put down, proceeded to eject the canons and senior priests from their high stools and take their place. And take their places, sorry. At the same time, the baculus, or staff of office properly belonging to the precentor, a precentor, pre can't remember how to say that, the canon responsible for the ordering of the services, was handed over to the person chosen by the subdeacons to be their full precentor, who might one of their own, who might be one of their own number, or an actual fool co-opted for the occasion, m mirroring the replacement of the king with a, a fool king, shaving their hair, putting a cross in their hair. In cathedrals, he might be called the fool bishop or fool abbot. In churches under papal dispensation, even the fool pope. What followed over the, ne over the next few days is commonly described as burlesque, a turning upside down of the normal liturgy. It is more accurately seen and understood as a literal acting out of the Magnificat, in which the nobodies among the clergy, as represented by the fools and his assistants, were exalted 
uh, the nobodies in inverted commas, the nobodies, the low, the underclasses, were exalted as a salutary foretaste and even uh, and prophetic anticipate, anticipation of the last judgment. One of the main events of the feast day itself, which is the circumcision, was a ceremonial entry into the church of that most humble of animals, an ass. That's the animal, of course, on which Jesus rode into Bethlehem, if I'm not mistaken, bearing a young mother and her child in commemoration of the flight into Egypt, while a special hymn was sung, Orientis Partibus Adventavit Asinus. From eastern lands, the ass is come, or the donkey, beautiful and very brave, well fitted to bear burdens. Up, sir, ass, and sing. In the mass that followed, its constituent parts each ended with an imitated bray. Bray is the sound that a donkey makes. With an imitated bray from the celebrant. And in place of the final dismissal of the, to the congregation of Ite Missa Est, which is the wonderful thing you hear at the end of this Catholic Mass, I remember hearing, go, the Mass is ended. Woo-hoo-hoo! It brings back weekends of Sunday pleasure, memories of being released from church. <laughs> go, the Mass is ended. Ite Missa Est. The rubrics laid down that he was to bray three times the celebrant and that the people should respond in similar fashion. One person in the in the church community brays like a donkey. Someone else, uh, so everyone else in the congregation has to respond like this in the church. <laughs> Donkeys make an amazing sound if you hear them. Hugely complex, loads going on, wheezes and puffings. They sound like the bellows you use to a puff of fire mixed in with like the the squealing of metal on a, the wheels of a metro <laughs> or a metro train um so with all of this sound clanging around these beautiful english churches and minsters and cathedrals and yet this was a true mass mass with a capital m celebrated not by the fall but by an ordained priest in which everything that happened was carefully prescribed and reverently carried through in a spirit of good humored enjoyment in a sermon at christmas francis of assisi who was never more than a deacon in ecclesiastical rank is reported to have imitated the bray of an ass in his pronunciation of bethlehem uh, there's also sort of a mini escape uh, escape valve within mass anyway on the sunday where you um you give peace to the people around you, you sort of shake someone's hand and whatever, you kiss the old ladies. And it's sort of a break, a pause in the endless onslaught of this kind of McDonaldized, Disneyfied approach to the Bible, which is, in my opinion, my experience of Catholic Mass. The Feast of Fools is now usually discussed in terms of its later abuses. Attempts at reform, it is true, specified that the shouts of déposui, or put down, be limited to five, and no, and not more than three buckets of water should be poured over the full precentre at Vespers. There are reports of old shoes being burned on the altar in place of incense. It's mad, isn't it? <laughs> and of riotous assemblies in the streets at night. It was excesses such as these that led to the feast's suppression in England by the end of the 14th century and in France a century later. I would love to know what it is about the late 1300s in England that causes the end to the Feast of the Fools. Maybe a larger statewide insecurity, in the persistent plagues that were spreading around Europe, uh, the wide anti-papal movements or the sentiments that were spinning around Europe at the time. Um, the abuses of Catholic offices, uh, the demands for, uh, what's that thing that Luther didn't like? Gratifications, what they called? Favorings, where you had to pay the church to get your soul preserved in heaven. Um, who knows? But it's an interesting thing. Late 1300s, this festival is kind of pushed out or tamed or diluted at the very least. So, but in France, it left a century later. The French <laughs> held on to this wonderful tradition for a bit longer. Maybe us Brits were too uh, repressed, sexually speaking, and so on, 
for this wonderful feast. But everywhere it left behind it a rich and lasting legacy. In France and elsewhere on the continent, its potential for an anarchic jollification and satirical comment on the abuses of government, both ecclesiastical and lay, were exploited by the Société Joyeuse, a secular full, secular full societies of bourgeoisie based in the towns, who came together wearing a uniform habit de fou, the cloak or the habit of the fool, at Christmas and carnival time to take part in elaborate plays and processions. In England, it survived in the form of secular celebration of the 12 days of Christmas, over which the Lords of Misrule, Lords of Misrule, were appointed to preside at court in magnate and manorial households, schools and universities, and the boy bishops were to retain their popularity until the eve of the Reformation. I guess Protestant Europe strips away all of these really fun things. Uh, the notable example being uh, Christmas su supposed to have been banned, it kind of wasn't really under Cromwell's England in the 1650s. Um, but the, the, the banning of theatre, for example, uh, the, the banning of fun in mid 1600s England. So Protestantism might have just tried to purify Christianity and strip away all of these elaborate traditions. Falls of one kind or another and comedy generally have been associated with the Christmas season ever since. But the message that the Feast of Falls was primarily intended to deliver was a spiritual one and it deserves respect as a genuine expression of liturgical drama, as authentic in its origins and early history as the gentler ritual of the three Marys or the Magi making their way to the crib at the Epiphany. Turning from the evidence of popular literature of theology and the Christmas liturgy to court records of the late Middle Ages, we find that in contrast to the situation in France where frantic fools, uh, Sibulo, Ancelin, Coq, Triboulet, make their regular appearances, the naturals retained by English monarchs in their households are not so easily distinguishable from their artificial minstrel colleagues and were of a kind that we would now describe in ordinary language as simple-minded rather than frantic. It is only on the basis of the type of payments they received and other contextual details that we are able to separate them. The point is, these so-called natural innocent fools, potentially mentally retarded fools, provided inspiration for the so-called professional or artificial ones, and there becomes a, a distinct blurring between the, the two. What I think is going on is that the professional fools who were paid more and given maybe more of a stature and standing, they drew inspiration from the fools. And why is that? Well, fools, idiots and mad people have always been admired for their counterintuitive thinking, just like children. Only a kid would say that. This ability to perceive the world in a fresh or very unusual way. That's why I feel very strongly that it's actually very hard to try to be stupid. It's really, really difficult to make dumb comedy because uh, we're so used to thinking rationally. I really enjoy uh, lowbrow, lowest of the low, distasteful humour because in a way, seeing the world again, it's so stupid. No one would have thought of saying something so bad and silly and sacrilegious and distasteful. But in its own way, it's this kind of strange intuition that uh, at least gives me a lot of delight. In 1311 and 12, sorry, in 1311 to 12, for example, Isabella, Edward II's queen, Edward II was the purportedly gay queen, uh, gay queen, <laughs> homosexual king, Freudian slip there. Uh, Edward II was the one Derek Jarman made a film about, um, uh, I don't know when he made it, but yeah, it was the one who um, uh, was not in a very effective king and largely seemed to squander his power reluctant to rule and instead spend time with his court favourite, whose name I completely forget. So this is in the early 1300s. Edward II's queen, Isabella, was sheltering a certain Michael, described as the queen's fool in her household. As Michael was capable of handling, handling money, he was given four shillings, four pounds. Oh God, I don't know. Four S, four D. I don't know what, how to say that. To buy shoes and other small necessities for himself at York in the year and is termed fool rather than idiot. He was clearly something short of insane, but the money he received was listed in the Queen's accounts as alms, not wages. Alms are the donations to the poor, alms houses. 
and while, and he was thus in, in quite a different category category to the minstrel fools who we have previously noticed who accorded the title mister and provided with expensive outfit, outfits of imported cloth and squirrel fur uh, from this moment i might be skipping over quite a bit because it's already over an hour or coming to an hour let's see how it goes um and it's sort of it's a little bit heartbreaking that uh you can't i can't quite get the good definition to show you the pictures here but i might try to somehow uh put links to my photographs of the pictures here because they are really really delightful there's one of a family of amateur fools on their way to a fate a family of amateur fools on their way to a fate so let's see if i can just do this no it's not really worth it someone send me a proper webcam go on <laughs> anyway uh, it's just delightful you see a family uh, mother and father cradling four children in these little baskets and they're dressed up in, in minstrel outfits it's a total delight um, shame I can't share it with you from the admittedly fragmentary wardrobe and other household accounts that survive, it would appear that Edward II was the first of the English kings to retain such innocence on a regular basis among his immediate following. For him, they filled a place in the odd, odd assortment of inferior people, act, inferior, of course, in, in inverted commas, actors, carters, ditchers and boatmen, with whom he was given to passing his time in preference to those younger members of the nobility who regarded themselves as his proper companions by right of birth and who were deeply resentful of being so excluded. No wonder Derek Jarman made a film about Edward II. But it was as fellow gamesters that he kept the innocents about him rather than as entertainers in the usual sense. The earliest known to us, a man named Robert Bussard, is, or Bussard, is first mentioned in 1303 when Edward was 18 and Prince of Wales, the first of that title, to his father, Edward I. Robert is recorded as be having been paid four shillings, I think that's four shillings, four S, for the trick the prince played him in the water that day. So the king does something cruel to this poor Robert, and incidentally a lot of these fools were called Robert, um, and then for the delight that it gave Edward II, he just pays this fool a little bit of money. It's very bizarre. It's like a some bizarre tip you, you see all the time in American, you know, I don't know, cultures and films and stuff, uh, films. In January 1316, a chronicler was to sneer over the fact that Edward, then king, had taken a winter break in the Fens that he might refresh his soul with the solace of many waters and had had a narrow escape from drowning while rowing about on various lakes. If, as seems likely, his early expedition had been of a similar kind and had ended in a ducking for Robert, his payment to the fall of a sweetener becomes readily understandable when we learn that the season was February and the place Scotland. <laughs> As we know of Robert thereafter, in that sometime between 1303, the year of his watery misadventure, and in 1307, he was sent off by the prince's father to the Yorkshire Abbey of Meaux, Meaux, M-E-A-U-X, to pass the rest of his days in peaceful retirement. There was nothing unusual in this. It was a procedure much resorted to by Edward I, whereby the king could secure a retirement home for former royal retainers and dependents, especially those too old or ill to fend for themselves. At minimum cost to a depleted exchequer, too many wars with France, I'm guessing, nor was it out of the way that he failed to consult with the abbot beforehand. So you can imagine these poor fools, natural or otherwise, living in these sort of basic retirement homes that were very, very cheap to maintain. When it, it, the rest of England was at war with France, constantly using loads of money, the king sends the fool there without having told the abbot. And then the rest of the church hierarchy thinking, this man is living in the lap of luxury, yet he's, a, he's an innocent or he's a fool. And you can imagine there's some interesting tensions going on. <laughs> Uh, you earn your retirement simply by being ducked in the water in a cold fe Scottish February morning. Okay. After his accession in 1307, Edward acquired another fool called Robert, a nickname that confusingly was given to nearly all royal fools in his own and the succeeding reign of Edward III. 
whether natural or artificial, and whatever their baptismal name may have been. And earlier, Robert had served as minstrel fool to Edward's mother, Eleanor of Castile, and may have set the precedent. In 1312, Robert III was allowed 20 shillings, I think it's 20 shillings, to buy a targe or small shield for some kind of exhibition, perhaps a mock combat in the king's presence. And there is mention also of a garcio to look after him. I think it must be something like a garçon, like a, a, a small boy, like a page, perhaps. Five years later, Edward, and presumably Robert, received a vid- visit from a lady named as Dul- Dulcia Withstaff. That's an attractive name. Dulcia Withstaff. Mother of Robert, the king's fool. It is good to know that, in spite of his adoption by the king, relations between the fool and his natural family had not been entirely broken off. The Bernard Le Foy, Le Foll, Bernard de Foll, and his 54 companions whom Edward encountered on a visit to Pontoise in 1313, coming naked before the queen, before the king, excuse me, coming naked before the king with dancing revelry, were almost certainly members of one of the French full societies with their paid professional who had gone a stage further in their impersonation of actual fools by abandoning clothes altogether, or at the least (laughs) stripping down to their underwear, like the madmen of the Salters. Seems to be a bit of a theme going on. We've got uh, what's kind of a predecessor of Shakespeare's troops of actors. It's also quite a thing with stripping down in times of crisis uh, in medieval Europe. Not to mention those pesky Quakers. These amateur fools, wearing their normal uniform costume of eared hood and sh- and bells, so eared hoods, you know what I mean? Like the kind of the devil in, in The Simpsons has that kind of strange costume on. Uh, oh, I've just I've lost myself here. Who had gone stage further in the impersonation of actor fools. Um, these amateur fools wearing their normal uniform costume of eared hood and bells and sometimes carrying their children with them in portable cots throng the margins of 14th century French and Flemish manuscripts as in the Géant de Gris miniatures of the Roman d'Alexandre above and over. They should not be confused, as they often are, with professional court fools of either the natural or artificial kinds. In view of what is known of the character and interests of Edward III, which inclined more to the theatre of chivalry and war than to the play of minstrels or fools, it is no great surprise to find that that of the three Roberts who appear briefly in in the records of his reign, so Edward III went through three fools, all of them called Robert in the early 1300s, two are associated with other members of the royal family rather than with the king himself, himself. Both of these were mentally competent. Excuse me. The master Robert Le Foll, Robert IV, supplied by Edward's consort Philippa of Hainaut, Hainaut, okay, I don't know if that's right, with an elaborate outfit of striped cloth and furs at an indeterminate date after 1328, is specifically described as a minstrel. And Robert Le Foll, whose annual grant of four quarters of wheat, four swine, Wow, you get four pigs a year, an ox, and four cartloads of hay, was restored by the Black Prince in 1362. Following the prince's marriage to Joan of Kent, was then enjoying an independent life as a country squire, not bad, and was probably a former minstrel retainer of Joan's in retirement. Only William Shubain, otherwise called Robert Foll of St. Albans, or Robert Foll, Robert VI, who was sent to the abbot and convent of his hometown in 1361 to have such maintenance as Robert Bussard had formerly enjoyed at Mew appears to have been such an inno- has, appears to have been an innocent and though this Robert was to be the last of a long line of pensioners at St Albans rather than the first as Robert the second had been at Mew the abbot likewise protested and in return for certain lands that were ceded to the king in compensation was successful in attaining from Edward and undertaking to quit his claim to the coronation but only after Robert's death. Uh, Queen Philippa also kept an idiot called Jakeman in her household. We we learn only from an exchequer account of 1374, which is five years after her death, 
which records that the fact that Jakeman's keeper at Westminster was still receiving the allowance of the king's alms for his maintenance. As the payments are designated alms or alms, Jakeman is unlikely to have been one of those insane people who, having inherited land or property, became subject to the statute de prerogativa regis and were known as king's idiots. By the terms of the statute, which is of uncertain date but usually attributed to 1323 or 4, such people became wards of the king and were kept not out of charity, as Jakeman would have been, but for the value of their income. Like other wardships, this could be farmed out to any of the king's courtiers or servants whom he wished to favour, hence the later expression, to beg for a fool. There is no evidence, however, to suggest that they were put on public display. Jakeman's position at court was probably similar to that of Isabella's Michael in the previous reign. Both received alms, neither was designated the king's idiot. That is going to be it for today from this chapter as it gets rather technical into the sort of the late 1300s and uh, I might try and digest this and spew it out properly uh, tomorrow or at some other point. Thanks everyone for listening. Thanks for all the things that you're doing and streaming. It's keeping me very happy and I love any comments, criticisms, insults on my terrible pronunciation and um, be nice and wash your hands. Thank you very much, everyone.